Welcome, my friends, to the Bob and Brad podcast produced by Bob and Brad, the two most famous physical therapists on the internet. I am Bob, and I'm exactly one half of the Bob and Brad team. Today, I'm going to be joined by an old friend of sorts because we've been in correspondence through email for uh, probably two or three years. And I would consider him the expert on costochondritis, which is what we're going to talk about today. He's also got a lot of expertise in a lot of posture issues, but mainly today we're going to talk about costochondritis. It's Steve August. He's from New Zealand. You may not know this, but New Zealand is really one, probably would say one of the world leaders in manual therapy. That is using your hands to help correct problems. And he had costochondritis himself uh, for over a long period of time. And as we've said before, whenever we get some malady, uh, we become much better at treating it. And, and so has he. And he's got the solution for you that you can treat costochondritis on your own. Watch the show. You'll get a lot of it. Uh, Steve August, this. welcome to the program. Hello, Bob. Thank you very much for having me on. We've corresponded back and forth over the years, and uh, this has been a uh, true honor to have you on the program and, and gather some of your knowledge. <laughs> uh, it's the other way around. I, I am so appreciative um, of the call. I got the call. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. I got the call. Very well deserved. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start her off right away. We've got a lot of material to cover. Um, we're going to cover mostly costochondritis today. Um, and then hopefully in a future occasion, we'll cover some of the other things that uh, you're, you're really uh, an expert at. And uh, I think we'll start with that. Could you give a summary of your background and maybe some of your influences? I know that's probably more for physical therapists, you know, to be helpful, but I, I'd still like to hear them. <laughs> sure. Well, basically, I'm a New Zealand uh, physiotherapist, which is pretty much the same as a physical therapist in um, America. So I was the oldest one in my class. So I had done quite a lot of things before starting into physiotherapy age 27. Uh, I, I do have a, an earlier degree in maths and geography, um, which was surprisingly useful because geography teaches you about large interrelating systems and that's the human body. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I, I had knocked around the world as a, a climber <clears throat> for a number of years having discovered that they'd pay me a great deal of money to put up transmitter tiles and power pylons. And I've worked in the Australian outback and uh, Antarctica and various other places. Um, and then about age uh, 27, I thought, well, I'd quite like to work with people. So it's um, funny, Brad was a late student too. How was he? Yes. Yeah. He worked on motors. He was like in, right. in, in the factories. I mean, he repaired well, them. I mean, that's that's what we do as physical right, therapists. Right. It's, it's like um, mechanics, only they're on the yeah, body. Yeah, exactly. But, um, but it also does mean that you come in with a bit of experience, and I guess mm -hmm. you are assessing what's useful, and you're really not there to um, to stuff around. You want to do useful things on people. So I, I've enjoyed it immensely. Um, but um, anyway, um, but the... Uh, now, I want to say this, you know, New Zealand has come up with some great therapists, um, obviously hmm. McKenzie and Mulligan. And uh, yeah. what is your relationship with um, Australia? Do you mind if I ask? Um, it's possibly a little the same as uh, Canada and the US. Um, no, well, look, we get on fine with them. They're, they're, they are good guys. They are good manual physios. Um, the manual physio is really mostly the, the, the hands-on approach to yes. bodies uh, i mean of course it incorporates exercises and strengthening and um all sorts of other things but uh the the the, the strength i think of um new zealand and australian physio uh was basically a lot of the hands-on techniques that we came up with um and i thought about it as well because uh robin mckenzie's um uh reduction approach to low back bulging discs is now the second biggest um, approach to non-surgical approach to low backs in the US. And this is from a guy um, just north of me uh, in New Zealand. Um, and then I, I think because we're small, um, we still tap into 
uh, the worldwide medical network of research. Um, but we all sort of know each other, like I, I, I knew Rob. Oh, and sure. I knew um, and so we tend to pull ideas. And I think secondly, because we're small um, and we're egalitarian, uh, we also know the doctors. So we talk to them a lot as well. Um, and I don't think that happens so much in the UK, for instance. And so again, um, you get a, an exchange of ideas. And uh, I guess the last thing is we um, we, we actually have a, um, a, a, a no-fault um, uh, insurance arrangement really? covering, covering all of New Zealand, which means that as a physio, I can decide, well, look, this looks like it's worth trying as a treatment approach. Um, let's do it. And I'm not worried about, um, you know, if anything goes wrong, uh, somebody says, well, you know, um, you, you, you diverged from the, um, sure. the, norm. from the normal part. We can sue you. So that doesn't happen in New Zealand. So we can invent stuff, uh, I think, in a way that's maybe easier than in the, um, in the US. Um, but um, I don't know, mostly it's fun. You, you, you're really solving problems. You're trying to work out what's actually going to help on the patient. And um, well, you um, solved the big one with Castor. You well, <laughs> this is such an extraordinary situation. This is costochondritis. This is not business as usual. This is um, moderately mad. Uh, and I, I, first off, I, I have to say, I have stumbled into this purely by chance because I had costochondritis myself for seven years after falling off a mountain. Um, and I, I bashed up around the, the back of my left rib cage. And for the next seven years, I would get um, what costo patients get, which is um, sharp, scary, happen to be left-sided chest pain um, sure. for, for no apparent reason, um, clicking and popping at the, the joints at the, at the front, a um, bit of pain around the back as well, inability to breathe in fully, because the, the, the ribs around the back were um, thoroughly jammed up, couldn't sure. move, didn't move for seven years. And this is what the, um, uh, you know, although I was very fit, uh, I was climbing mountains, everything checked out fine, but you still think, well, hang on, the doctors also told me that it would settle down and go away, and it didn't for seven years. So you start to wonder, well, if they got that wrong, you know, were they also wrong about it being the heart? Anyway, so I, I, I lived with this um, and the, then qualified as a physiotherapist. And the first practice I worked in, um, you know, after a while I mentioned this to the, uh, the boss and said, well, let's have a look. Well, you, you're frozen solid on the rib joints around the back where the, the impact had, had hit. Um, so he rolled me on the back and click, 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 unlocked those with manipulation. And... I've never forgotten what it felt like. For, for the first time in seven years, I could take a full breath in again. So, um, so there's nothing like having the problem yourself to give you- um, Exactly, uh, we say real, that all the time. <laughs> a real and, interest in working and, out what's going and, on. And plus you can think about it all the time. You mold it yeah. over for probably seven years. Absolutely, yes. You try different yeah. things and- Yeah, it, it, it moves beyond an academic interest, definitely. Right, uh, exactly. So I always had a, um, a real interest in costochondritis. And by the way, this was over 30 years ago now, and it's completely fixed. I've never had a twinge. I never think did, about it. Did the um, manipulation alone do it? Or did no, you? Um, no, the manipulation was definitely useful um, and unlocked the hinges, essentially. But if you just do that with manipulation, then they'll just freeze up again. Um, I mean... This is the core, really, of, of why we've been using the back pod so much specifically for costochondritis, um, because it'll, it'll stretch around the hinges. So right. um, I, I should say that um, manipulation in New Zealand is a standard physiotherapy thing. I, I'm not sure it's the same in the US in all of the states. It's, but it's spotty. It's yeah. spotty. Some um, places it's okay, some places it's not thought that was the case well yeah. here it's mostly the physiotherapists that do it um, oh, we, do interesting. Have, we do have chiropractors here and osteopaths but um again we're small and we tend to work in 
Uh, like I was taught my manipulation by a, a New Zealand trained physio who was also a British trained osteopath, and he was teaching through physiotherapy. So it's it's a sure. standard um, part, only part, but it's 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 standard part of physiotherapy in New Zealand. So it gives us this this great range of techniques, and I guess we do because we're doing um, specific manipulations. We are getting quite good at understanding. Um, specific um, spinal joint and rib joint movement. Sure. And there's a whole variety of esoteric um, techniques that we've also developed, especially Brian Mulligan's ones that you mentioned. Anyway, so so we're sort of quite good in that area. So um, we've we've I've been using manipulation myself for maybe about um, you know 30 odd years as a physiotherapist um, where appropriate. And it's highly useful for unlocking a um a frozen hinge um you you do it carefully and you do safety checks first and um but it's it's very useful for unlocking the hinge which is what happened um with me sure. however this is where we really do diverge completely from traditional um, um us chiropractic say or the the chiropractic approach where you just keep banging the hinges free right well so the, the, the hinges, um, the rib hinges or, or um, spinal hinges, when they've been jammed up for long enough, um, they're, they're surrounded by collagen, um, making up the ligaments and joint capsules and fascia. Now, this is massively tough stuff. Collagen is, is stronger weight by weight, uh, you know, by weight than uh, steel wire. Wow. And um, it's what holds your skeleton together. Muscles just move it around. So it's sure. really tough stuff. So if you've got a joint which has been jammed up for um, certainly months, certainly years, um, then all the collagen around it will have frozen down around that mobile joint like a, um, uh, a grape turning into a raisin. Sure. So you can come along and do a manipulation and bang, unlock the, um, the hinge, a bit like hitting a rusty hinge with a hammer. And as I say, it's, it's very effective. But that same split second click cannot um, stretch out the, um, the shortened, massively tough collagen around sure. the hinge. It's just physically impossible. It's like if your hamstrings were so tight you couldn't touch your knees. You know, you cannot stretch down to touch your toes in a split second. It, it just doesn't exactly. happen. So that's why you get what we think is a pretty nutty result from um, just, um, well, mostly chiropractic um, manipulation where right. um, where they're the banging the hinges free. I mean, um, the the tight collagen around it just freezes them up again. So sure. you get this, this nice instant freeing up. Um, nothing wrong with that whatsoever. But if you don't also stretch the collagen, then it just freezes up again. And we just, we don't think that's satisfactory. So um, we tend to use um, manipulation where it's needed, um, but also serious collagen stretching. And that's why we built the back pop, because as far as the thoracic spine goes and rib cage, uh, the only practical, useful um, way of stretching out the collagen around the, the rib hinges and spinal hinges is lying back on um, this little um, home fulcrum that yep. we we built, a bit like a um, we call it a bit like a cushioned power. They're called in New Zealand. They're called abalones in in the US. Um, but so you're using your upper body weight with enough, uh, which has enough um, um, uh, force, lying back over the little peak shape of the back pod, and that's enough leverage to actually stretch the collagen. Because you can you can stay on that for um, half a minute or a minute or later on minutes at a time, sure. and that gives you the the long enough, strong enough, um, specific enough um, stretch to stretch out the collagen so the joints can stay moving and you get a permanent improvement instead of just a, a very temporary one. Steve, you that was you, all. It was about. Do you want to explain why you're stretching out in the back and the pain is in the front? I, sure. I understand that, but I don't think, you know, the audience understands that. 
Absolutely. Um, look, I, I, I need to, to go back for people watching this um, and just sure. emphasize again that this is an extraordinary situation. On the one hand, you have most doctors in the world um, understanding costochondritis wrongly and therefore treating it wrongly mm -hmm. and therefore not fixing it. And right. this is not me being cranky. Um, they are incorrect in the, the standard treatment um, according to the actual existing medical research, which I've gone back through. As I say, this is an extraordinary situation. Um, the, um, the word costochondritis means um, basically inflammation of the rib cartilages. The itis ending means inflammation. Now, okay, so a busy caring doctor um, righto, it's not the heart. We've been through all the tests. Um, it's not the right. heart, it's not the lungs, it's not anything dire. Um, it's this thing called costochondritis. So the doctor can relax and say, all right, it's an itis ending, it's an inflammation, take these anti-inflammatories. Now, it's only a word. And the uh, I've been back through all the costochondritis research that's been published. There's only about 2,000 bits on it and there is no um, reason whatsoever for using this costochondritis word to describe the problem and then the word carries this explanation that it's an inflammation right and then everyone goes off down this um, blind alley of right. we've got to press the inflammation um um, if the anti-inflammatories don't work, um, then we'll try steroid shots into the sure. root uh, shed. But nobody's actually standing back and saying, yeah, but why is the problem there in the first, first place? place? Yes. And I, it also then goes on to um, the, um, the popular medical sites. Uh, like I, I, I looked up a few of them before coming on here. You've got WebMD. It says the cause is usually unknown. Healthline says the exact cause of costochondritis is unknown. Mayo Clinic says costochondritis usually has no apparent cause. It also says it usually goes away on its own, although it could last several weeks or longer. This is simply incorrect, according to the research. Right. This is yes. an extraordinary situation. It is. It's amazing <laughs> yeah. how, how long it takes for the medical field to turn around. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, the, I, so I've been pulled into this because I had this um, background um, understanding of costochondritis. So just to, to, to jump forward into what costochondritis actually is. And again, this is actually supported by the best medical research that is already there, um, peer reviewed um, and, and all. So um, basically what costochondritis is, if you... Uh, uh, Got my old bucket illustration. Um, if you think fantastic. Of, I like it's that. A, <laughs> it's the old bucket handle model of breathing. Yeah. So you've got a bucket and you've, you've got um, a handle on the bucket and it's got a hinge on, on, on both ends. Okay, that's like your rib cage. So every time you breathe in, the, um, the ribs um, breathe up a bit. And when you breathe out, they go down a bit. And, and they're designed to hinge and around the back where the ribs hinge onto your spine and around the front where they hinge onto your back, on, onto your breastbone, also called the sternum. Now, if the hinge at the back can't move, and that can happen fairly easily for a variety of number of reasons, then the much more delicate hinge on your, um, on your, your breastbone has to move excessively just to let you breathe and move around. Now, this is completely unequivocal. It's not opinion or anything like that. You've got two hinges there um, for a reason. And if the one at the back is frozen, then the one at the front has to move excessively to compensate to let you keep breathing. Now, with costochondritis, um, the, the, for a variety of reasons, I can go into them, the, the rib hinges around the back have frozen sod and they are not moving. Therefore, the ones on the front which are much more delicate. They're just like little fingers of, of bone sort of um, anchoring onto, your, onto the side of your, your breastbone. They're not really structurally very strong. So they're moving excessively. And one of the dead giveaways that this is going on is they start clicking and popping and cracking, um, which I've had also. 
So it's it's like the hinge, like a rusty hinge, sort of giving a bit as it moves, and it generally starts out just clicking and popping and not being painful. But then you do some sort of movement or um, or you sleep on it in an odd way, and it goes a bit further, and you can get seriously scary, sharp stabbing pain. Um, it feels like a knife going in, and I've had it, and it is scary. And I completely sympathize with all the cross chondritis patients out there because if it happens to be on the left hand side, you think, help, am I having a heart? Exactly. Um, and incidentally, anybody working, watching this, first time you get chest pain, yes, you do yes. go to the emergency department, um, also called an um, accident and emergency department. Yes, it could be the heart. Always, always, first step is go and get that checked out. Yes. Um, but then, you know, cheeringly, um, over half of um, chest pain presenting to an emergency department is not the heart or lungs wow. or anything dire like that. Um, it's a bit difficult to get exact figures, but um, talking to some of the ED uh, doctors over here, they, they reckon about two thirds of what comes through the door is actually what I've been describing, the, um, uh, the, the giving of the rib hinges on the breastbone. Um, but th this is really big, Bob, because um, um, chest pain is the second biggest presentation to emergency departments um, worldwide. And most of it is just what we're describing. Uh, sure. Costochondritis problem, which where I work in New Zealand is a very straightforward um, mechanical problem, which is, is completely understood and, and easily sorted out. Uh, I mean... Jumping ahead a little, um, all you're really needing to do is free up the um, uh, the tight rib machinery around the back. Sure. There's various simple, straightforward physical therapy type ways of doing that. And then definitely you may also need to um, do some treatment around the front, but mostly um, pec stretching and um, working through any scarring around the front as well. But essentially, it's not a difficult problem. Um, there's... I, you know, I, I used to love them coming in the door because they're easier to sort out than the average back or neck problem. Um, there's no discs involved for a start. And um, it's it's really just a, a mechanical machinery freeing up problem. Uh, no wonder um, Brad liked this, by the way. It's, it's, it's just like working on a car. It's, and, and, um... you know, unfortunately for Brad, too, I, I can't yeah. remember. He went into the ER twice, at least, maybe three times. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he, he did the back pod and it worked and then he stopped and, yeah. and it came back again. And now he's been yeah. doing it because, <laughs> but yes, I think is, yeah. I've noticed a couple of people that got it from, would feel the pain while biking, which makes sense yeah. to me. It seems like they're using the rib cage a lot and they might be bent yeah. over too. So yes. can you, can yeah. you name some of the other, uh, common causes that like things that might've caused it in the first place? Yeah, um, there's quite a few, and it's not that difficult to do. Um, impact, like falling off a mountain will do it, Bob. Sure. Um, <laughs> you found that one out. Eh? I did. Um, <laughs> but also you get other forms of impact. It's really any sort of um, sufficient impact on the ribcage. Um, car crashes is a really common one, where you're hitting the airbags or the um, seatbelt in the front. And yes, it'll um, it'll impact on the front, and you can get bruising around the front, um, and that'll generally settle down. But the, the the jolt goes through to the rib hinges behind as well, and these are much more robust and um, stronger than the ones on the front. Uh, there's actually two joints, costovertebral and costotransverse, so they're they're a, um, a, a a tough thing anyway. And if you get enough impact and scarring around them, um, they, they can certainly freeze up and then stay frozen. I mean, that's one of the other things that the research shows. Uh, there's only one piece of research um, on how long costochondritis lasts for, but uh, only the one published ever. Um, and basically it says over half of it um, was there a year later um, oh, wow. uh, from the initial incident. Now. It's then that's then been taken to to mean well that means it'll settle down in a year. No, it doesn't. Um, that what the actual research says is when they checked it at a year's time, 
over half of the patients were still sore. Now, I've, I've done an impromptu survey on uh, patient.info, which is a, a UK site, um, of the first 100 um, patients on that who mentioned how long they'd had their costochondritis for. And the average was 2.2 years, ranging, oh from just, ranging from just a few days to 30 years plus. And we've actually had um, patients who've had costochondritis for about 30 years, and we've got them right. Um, oh my which God. is, uh, it, it, this is an extraordinary situation. I, oh, um, that is crazy. <laughs> It's, you know, um, I would I would guess that a lot of people just give up and and so you, yes. you don't they don't know that it's continued the doctors because yeah. they don't hear back from them so they assume it got yeah. better and well um, that that absolutely happens and there's also research out there saying that uh, um, look basically um, if the doc hasn't got you right in three months whatever particular problem it is, then 90% of patients will stop going to the doctor for that. Right, of course. Problem, so, which is sort of fairly human. Um, but so um, so other, other forms of impact. The eye hunch um, is uh, probably about the most common one where um, this is something that we built the back pod for in the first place, where um, you've got everybody um, hunching over laptops, tablets, and smartphones. And we call it the eye hunch because um, it's this enormous tsunami of neck and upper back problems happening purely because of the new technology. Uh, it's great technology. I use a, um, right. a, a you know, phone myself, laptop, tablet. We're not uh, anti-technology. <laughs> no, not anti-technology. Um, but um, uh, this is really quite funny when I'm talking to patients about this because you, you can you can see the thought balloon. He wants to take away my phone. Right, no right. Um, <laughs> exactly. But, um, but the thing with the, the, the small technologies is that unlike a desktop, you cannot set them up ergonomically correctly because you can't separate the screen from the keyboard. Right. You can with a with a laptop or a tablet or whatever buy an extra screen or an extra keyboard. Right. Exactly. Because you lose the portability. So essentially, there's no ergonomically correct way of using them. Um, you you can try and make it a bit easier, but you still essentially have yes. to bend forward to use them. And yes. we have a younger generation now that's grown up with the things that has thoracic spines, um, you know, bent forward like um, people in their 70s when it's I was uh, in, into Correct. physio. It's horrifying. It um, is. So, and anyway, so we, we built the back pod and um, uh, its little home program specifically to counter that, um, which again, you can do. It's all bog standard New Zealand physio, but because all of the, uh, the problem happens the same way because everyone's bending forward, then you can analyze out the bits that go wrong and just make a very limited, simple home program to counter that, including the back pod to, to actually stretch out the spine back to what it used, used to be. Because we all started out upright. You know, look at four-year-olds, um, you know, the, the head is right. balanced about, it's lovely to watch because they're automatically moving, moving perfectly correctly. They pick up things correctly. correct too. They, they, they pick up things correct too. Their yeah. back is straight. Yeah. They have yes. good, good mechanics. Yes, and then you 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 watch as life goes on. Anyway, so as part of such uh, a, a huge um, 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 problem in the population of people bending forward and getting frozen like that, once you get tight enough, nobody has enough muscle to straighten up. It, it's it's not a matter of um, sure. uh, of just straightening up. Um, you've got to use an external force because the, the thing, the, the thoracic spine freezes um, too much for any action you can do yourself to free it off. Um, it's, it's why you have to use, um, well, for instance, manipulation to unlock it, but then you've got to stretch um, as well, or you just go straight on to stretching got with it. something like the back pod. Anyway, so, but as part of the spine getting hunched and tight, the ribs, uh, rib cage um, also starts to freeze up. And that's um, probably the, um, one of the biggest drivers of costochondritis, because I think we are seeing more and more of it. So as people are getting hunched and tight, 
the ribs are starting to get tight around the back. And when they get tight enough, then the ones on the front have to start giving. And then bang, you've got your mysterious chest pain that nobody understands. Um, the, the, the other thing about um, nobody understanding it is that um, I've talked to various doctor friends and of course they do CAT scans and MRIs and right. X-ray, but um, this does not show on a CAT scan or an X-ray or an MRI because they are all still photos. Right. So it's like taking a photo of a gate hinge. You can't tell whether it's um, totally seized up or moving perfectly freely because it's just a still photo. So the, the scans and the x-rays cannot tell whether the, um, the rib joints around the back uh, are moving perfectly freely or frozen solid. solid. So the, the x-rays come back and they're all clear. And the, 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 the doctor says to the patient, well, okay, uh, you know, everything's good. But the patient sort of goes away thinking, yeah, but I'm still really in, 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 in real pain. Right. So then the doctor says, well, it'll, it'll relax. It's, it's, it's not the heart. It's not the, the major things. And this is good because the, the doctors are very good at, um, at checking these out. And right. that's, what, that's always the first step. So great. It's good that it's none of those things. However, um, the doctors then tend to say, relax, it'll settle down soon. And statistically, most of it doesn't. So the patient then thinks, um, uh, well, really if they wrong. were wrong about right. <laughs> that, they're wrong about it being the heart. So you, you see anxiety uh, and including panic attacks all the time as part of costochondritis. Understandable. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it, yeah, it's. I, I like I your say, hinge example. That, that's a very good visual. Um, yeah, it's, um, I mean, you, you, you do get people talking about, um, you know, putting something back in, it's out, so you have to put it back in. Well, right. that's a nonsense phrase, meaning right. absolutely, um, it's, I mean, it's, anyway, um, no. so, you know, it's interesting, <laughs> I, I, you remember patients sometimes, you know, from, I remember yeah. one, I, 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 I went to school at the Mayo Clinic, and uh, ah, right. I, I was a, first year graduate, I just graduated, and uh, a fellow, another student, um, he was having that chest pain right there. And they Fine. put him through a litany of tests and they yeah. couldn't come up with anything. And yeah. I, to this day, I'm sure it was that. I'm sure it was Costo. Yeah. And, well, and I, I feel I, terrible. I, <laughs> <laughs> well, you couldn't do anything about yeah, that. Yeah, we didn't know I, anything about it. No, and I'm, I sort of lucked into it because I had it myself and I happened to come through the system in New Zealand, which has a good understanding of these sort yes, of things. Yes, yes. Um, but it's pure luck. Um, so I've been lecturing to various medical conferences in New Zealand on spines and also costochondritis and also various EDs. Um, and uh, went down to the ED in my um, um, town here, Dunedin in, in New Zealand, and gave a, um, a long lecture on this is how we would see costochondritis. And I have to say, I was, a bit, I was slightly nervous about going into a 40 um, very bright, very tough, experienced ED. Exactly. And essentially saying, well, you guys have been doing it wrong. And the response was wonderful. Um, uh, you couldn't hear a pin drop. And at the end of it, the CEO, who'd been there for about um, 30 years, said, look, we're swamped with this stuff on a daily oh, basis. Interesting. And, and this is the first time anyone has ever made sense of it for me. So, I mean, the, the, the good ones are fully aware that um, they haven't, there's this whole area that they see all the time that they haven't um, uh, got a handle on. Exactly. I mean, I've I've actually been asked to do a, um, a paper for the British Medical Journal, um, uh, Australian office, um, reassessing costochondritis. And this happened because I was lecturing at a medical conference and I got put on a panel on chest pain. So I, I did a, uh, with uh, cardiologists and cardiac surgeons from the US and the UK and New Zealand. And, you know, seriously high powered types and um, I did a, a quick 15 minute riff on well this is this um, how we would see this uh, sure. call it um, chest pain 
And at the end of it, um, when we'd, we'd all finished talking to the audience, the, 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 the three uh, nearest me basically jumped on me um, and frog marched me down to um, the um, British Medical Journal stall and said, look, we're swamped with this stuff. And this is the first oh, wow. time anyone ever explained explained it. And you have to do an article by this guy. So I, I, I haven't finished writing the thing yet, but I've, I've actually put up a YouTube video on the research um, that's available in costochondritis. Um, and it, it, it's just quite extraordinary. The, Make the sure you thing... send it to us when you do, if you do uh, you complete it, because we'd like to put it on our website. Um, right. It's so helpful. Well, we'll do. Well, I've, I've, I've followed your example. and I, I put a, um, a YouTube video up already, which is basically just if you Google costochondritis and research and YouTube, you'll, you'll get me you'll get everything off for 20 minutes on, on what's there. But it was just sort of jaw dropping because the, what was said about costochondritis um, popularly from busy, concerned doctors was just um, uh, not what the actual research itself says. So I'm, I'm not the slightest bit running down doctors or research or anything no, like that. No, it, it's, no. Be, it's because I, I, I rate them so highly that this exactly. this sort of thing. So um, anyway, so, oh, I, I, I know I, I um, sidetracked myself. We, we were talking about other reasons for um, the, the rib hinges around the back channel. Developing it, yes. Um, one thing I would like to say is um, heart surgery. Open heart surgery is. I was going to ask you that. All oh, right. Um, it, look, it's such a classic. It's almost a guarantee of costochondritis because to do a sternal split operation, um, you're cutting down through the through the breastbone, and then these great big stainless steel claws pull the thing wide apart. Now, this does a massive strain on the the rib hinges around the back. It's like spraining your ankle three times round or something like that. It's just huge. And then totally unsurprisingly, um, after everything's sewn up, um, those rib hinges have been massively strained. So they'll they'll get adhesive fibrosis scarring. And so they freeze up. So they're frozen up. And then you get a double hit because um, from the, the scarring on the front, sure. scarring will bind down free nerve endings and make them hypersensitive. So you're getting an extra chunk of pain coming from that. So something like 70% of patients who've had a, a sternal split, uh, you know, heart operation, heart or lungs, will still have pain a year down the track. And the, the, the figures are moderately appalling, um, but the operations are done for absolutely the best reasons, life-saving reasons. Surgeons are surgeons and do surgery and they're good at it. But this follow-up, um, um, uh, for the costochondritis that happens and can just continue thereafter um, indefinitely uh, until somebody comes around and actually frees up the machinery. Um, and imagine it, the anxiety. It, 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 yes. Imagine the anxiety yeah. with somebody who's already had a heart problem and they're yeah. having chest pain. Yes, so, and every time they get a twinge, they think, well, you know, it's the chest pain coming back. Again. Right. You're making um, me feel more and more guilty because now I'm remembering all these patients I had that had a heart surgery. I'm serious. And they had the pain and we were just saying it was tightness and, and things that yeah. he's down and we weren't doing anything on the back at all. And well, oh boy. I, it, it, as I say, it, it, this is largely why I'm doing this because it's sheer luck. I happen to have it myself. So I had a, a, a personal interest in it. And then I happened to come up through New Zealand Physio which just took it as a, um, um, a straightforward um, mechanical problem well inside our usual set of techniques and understanding and um, basically fixed the things. And then what happened was um, I, we, we produced the back pod um, uh, for mostly for the eye hunch. And I thought, oh, well, so we did a really clunky um, um, phone shot video of me saying, well, by the way, this thing's really good for stretching rib joints. And that's what we use um, to fix costochondritis. And I thought it would get lost on YouTube. Um, sure. And 
it's like I, I, I was living, it's like a tsunami hit. <laughs> um, I, 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 when I look back on it, this was actually the first time anywhere on the net that anybody had said, well, look, hang on, you know, we just, this is how we regard it, straightforward mechanical problem, um, you know, we don't have any problems fixing it. Um, oh, by the way, the, this thing's good at stretching the rib hinges. Um, and um, I, I was getting, I think over about three years, I got something like 10,000 communications from oh my patients from all around the world. Um, um, it, 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 that's um, everything from YouTube comments to direct emails to phone calls, um, including from um, a number of doctors, which was really cheering. Mind you, they all had costochondritis themselves. Exactly. So that's exactly. why they wanted to know what was going on. Um, so well, so it opened our it, eyes. We saw the video and it opened our eyes. I mean, well, that just totally made sense. And, and congratulations. Um, yeah. I mean, that's that's the, the nutty thing. On the one hand, there's all this doom and gloom. Um, it, it it really dismays me on the um, you know uh, costochondritis Reddit pages and and groups and whatever. Oh, it's you know had this for years. I guess I'll have to live with it. Can't can't right. do this. Can't do that, you know. And and on the other hand, um, it, it was just where I work. It was just such a straightforward problem um, to sort out. Anyway. Um, Steve, so, you, would you mind, Steve, you know, maybe just briefly talking about the booklet that comes with it? It's actually a very comp comprehensive booklet. And uh, maybe just talk yeah. about the use of the, the uh, back pod and like yeah. how not to do it. Like I had my wife not do it correctly. So absolutely. Um, well, look, so this is what we developed. Like I said, we didn't develop it for costochondritis. But it's probably the single prime tool in the world for fixing costochondritis, and I'm not overstating that. Um, it, basically, because of the, the small peak shape, um, it can fit between the, uh, your spine and the inside of your, your shoulder blade. So you can actually get to the ribs, because there, you, generally speaking, you, the um, thoracic joints of your spine are tight as well but the ribs are the crucial ones. It's because the ones at the back can't move, then the ones at the front have to move excessively and freeing the ones at the back up is the irreducible core of fixing costochondritis. Any, any treatment you do for the front um, is, uh, some of it may be valid, absolutely, but it is simply missing the point if you're not sure. freeing off the thing around the front that's causing the pain at the, uh, sorry, not freeing off the bits around the back that's causing the strain at the front. Anyway, so the back pod itself, um, the, the core is polycarbonate, um, same thing they make the um, windshield of the F-22 Raptor out of it. Wow. Um, we, we drove a Jeep Cherokee over it to test it for America, Bob. So oh. um, no, it, it passed. So we were thinking of doing that ourselves, just as a funny <laughs> video. <laughs> uh, it's, it's seriously tough. Um, and it's got a, a, a cushioned outer. So yep. all you're doing is lying back on this um, with your knees bent well up and all it's, it's, your upper body weight is then pushing down on the, on the back pod. So you're getting a very nice little um, a controlled stretch on um, anything that's pushing on the peak of the back pod. And in, in this case, we're mostly going for the rib hinges, although you do the spine as well, because you want the whole lot to free up and the spine is usually hunched also and certainly tight also. So you, you're doing up and down the spine and also out to the size of the spine a bit to get the ribs. So it's the, it's the whole area you want to free up to what it used to be. Now, the one problem we get, and um, I was saying earlier, um, I have to say it's particularly young US males. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, the one problem we get is people not reading the instructions, hurling themselves on the back pod, and then going, ah, it's too sore, I can't use it. Now, if your hamstrings were so tight that um, you couldn't touch your knees, if you try and force down to the floor in one hit, then it will hurt. Um, exactly. So right. you don't do that. You only do a reasonable stretch each time and you expect that it'll take a few weeks for them to stretch out so you can touch your toes again. It's exactly the same with this. And it's clear in the um, in the instructions. This is the there's a 31 page booklet that comes with it, but there's three pages of how to use it properly. 
And all you do is you go to be tight. That's why you've got the thing in the first place. So if it's actually painful lying on the back pod, then you're just trying to do too much in one go. So all you do is put a pillow under your head or two or even three so that you're only getting a gentler stretch. You do have to feel something. Um, uh, if you Like if you were stretching your hamstrings, if you couldn't feel a stretch, then it wouldn't be doing it. Sure. Same with this. Um, you've got to have enough stretch to feel there's a bit of a stretch, but um, you just grade it so that it's reasonably comfortable. And you do expect that it's going to take, say, three weeks for most of it to free up mostly. Um, of course, it can vary, and it can take a lot longer than that. Um, but generally speaking, you're looking at a few weeks, but a clear, obvious improvement over the first week. You so, recommend uh, one time a day or throughout the day? or? Well, it's mostly that I try and hold people back for the first week so they don't do too much and sure. then get sore. Gotcha. So, I mean, a lot of, in a lot of cases, um, the, the joints have been frozen up solidly for um, months, if not years. And so you can't stretch that stuff instantly. So sure. I generally say, look, just you're in for the long haul. It's not instant. Um, I, I was telling you before, I did once have a um, very angry email from um, one guy, yes, a young American male. Um, who <laughs> had, he said, look, I've had costochondritis for five years. I've used the back pod for two days. It hasn't fixed it, so it's no good. Well, it's it, that's just sort of not reasonable. So, so it takes time. And all you have to do is grade it um, quietly. And there's, it's clearly described in the booklet um, so that you're only getting a bit of a stretch each time. And, and it along takes with that, you're supposed to be breathing. Yes. Thinking breathing. And they're all split, a lot of times the arms over the head, correct? Yes. Um, as things free up, and you can start discarding, um, the freer they get, the more you don't need pillows under your head. So um, um, when you get to the point where you don't need a pillow under your head, you know that things are moving um, quite well. Like we we're aiming for is being able to lie back on the back pod, no pillow, um, and all you have is a, um, right. a comfortable, um, uh, a satisfying stretch. Um, and it feels good because it is the right thing for it. So that means your, um, your, your spinal and rib joints are getting back to what everybody's used to be, um, completely free moving. I mean, if you lie back on this thing with, um, uh, and all the hinges moving fine, then you just get a satisfying stretch. Um, it's only sore when they're tight because right. they're tight. So all you do is take time to, to stretch through them. Um, so it's really, um, really become like a daily treat for us. So I, my, my wife, she always would give me a hard time about stretching all the time. And, and now things are starting to creep up on her and, and show up. And, um, so we started her on the back pod and, uh, when I was bringing it in today, you know, my version, my mind, I mean, my, my version, your back pod, she said, where are you taking that? Why, why are you taking it? She was, <laughs> She was, I'm going to need to do that later. And I said, don't worry, I'll bring it back. So it, it really went, if you miss, for me as a posture tool, if you miss a day or two, it's, I really start to feel it right away. I, I start yeah. to feel the pain between the shoulder blades or the, uh, yeah. the knots and the, the traps. Well, well, also you're tall, Bob. So yes, um, exactly. you're bending further forward than most people. Yeah. So, yes. um, and taller people, I mean, this is a classic thing from school, by the way, with, um, you know, the tall kids in the class hunting yes. forward to, exactly. to try and fit in. Um, and the spine starts to grow like that. Um, yep. You also do get a lot with young women. And I'm, I'm a bit dismayed at the, uh, the number of older or, you know, women, say, in their 30s or so, where um, uh, that I've treated, where the, the, the hunch, um, um, you know, was the was the problem, and and we got them right. But I'd right. say, where did it start from? And they'd say, well, in school, they said, you know, look, I started growing breasts, and I started getting comments from the guys. I got, I was shy. Yes, it yes. really yeah. started from there. And I'm, I, I almost think posture is a feminist issue. Anyway, um, but uh, there's so many things that can start off that um, that forward bending tightness. Um, so all we did was um, 
build something that you could lie back on. Um, it, it generally speaking, um, the, the, it freeing up, stretching free the hinges is the core of fixing costochondritis. But of course, there are other bits as well. And what I'm working on at the moment is a, a whole extra page on, um, it's called costochondritisanswers.com. Um, I think it'll be about another month or so before we can get it up on the, the Backpods website, but it'll also be a standalone. Again, let us, know when you, let us know when you have that up. I will do. I mean, the, the booklet was about 30 odd pages. Well, what I'm writing is essentially a, a, a textbook. Um, it's about 100 um, searchable, um, frequently asked questions um, because I, I've now had so much input from all around the world. I, I know what people want to know. And so um, sure. uh, it's, it's quite exciting because it's, it's searchable. You can go in and pick out the bits you want to know about and sure. straight to them. Um, which is quite remarkable. I mean, you know, if you think of a, a, a written textbook as linear and you've got to go all the way through the thing. Right. So this is essentially a textbook, but it's um, hopefully for doctors, um, um, surgeons, um, pain clinic, um, as well as patients, um, physios, chiropractors, osteopaths. Uh, I'm really attempting to, to dump out as much practical information um, as I can onto this thing. Um, taken quite a while, but um, I'm, I'm about a month or so away from getting it up there. Anything that uh, you want to do right is going to take a while, yeah. but I, I yeah. should, you know, I want to mention too that, you know, do you mention two strengthening exercises in this book and you, and you mentioned a stretch. Um, yes. So there's some other things that are in there. So Yes, the, 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 there's basically, we tried to keep it as simple as we could. Um, so it's absolute minimalist, but right. the other things you need to pull yourself upright are there's a couple of home massages, which are, are um, really useful because um, you can stretch muscles, but if they're um, tight enough and scarred with that tightness, which is is very common, that he's a fibrosis scarring, then nothing beats um, go, somebody going through with fingers and actually teasing through um, the, the, the muscle. So all the healthy elastic stuff will stretch, but the, um, uh, the little scarring um, adhesive fibrosis fibers that you get left over after any sort of strain will um, break apart and, and loosen off, which is exactly what you want. So there's a, a couple of um, home massage techniques shown in the user guide. Um, and one of them is just a, a sitting technique, which anybody can do. Sure. Um, so um, you've got to talk someone into it. I, I, I right. find bargains work better um, than favors. Um, you know, if, <laughs> if, if you do my back, I'll get you breakfast in bed, this sort of thing. <laughs> and, um, and there's a, a couple of very basic strengthening exercises just um, for between the shoulder blades. Um, and also the, the one that gets missed all the time is that the yes. head usually pokes forward. Yes. And if, if in a perfect neck, um, perfect spine, the, the head should be balanced above um, above the spine. So the, 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 the yes, earlobe yes. should be balanced above the point of your shoulder. Well, you'll see people walking around on the street these days, young ones in their teens, where the back of the head yes. is in front of the chest. I mean, this is, this is extraordinary. This is yes. Not business as usual. So this is the little collection of basics needed to, to pull back to how everything works best. Um, um, so anyway. Steve, so would, you say, uh, would you say, uh, I, I was curious on this point, um, let's say a larger person, a muscular person, would they possibly lie on the back pod and then maybe even put some weight on themselves to increase the amount of stress on there, or has that not been something you ever thought about? I have thought about it. Um, the, uh, the, the, yeah, the, the back part's almost a mid range thing. Uh, I mean, if we made it harder to, um, uh, so it would have just that bit more leverage again, then we'd put off a lot of people, um, who yes, don't need yes. to be that hard. Yes. Um, my, my sort of feeling is um, it'll 
uh, it's got the leverage to free things up reasonably. And there are ways you can um, increase that, uh, which are also in the user guide. Sure. Uh, you, were, you were mentioning them, um, just using your hands yeah. above your head and stretching up and down and lifting your backside off the ground. So you're getting yeah. more leverage onto the back pod itself. Sort of though, after that, um, you really, if you if you really do need more leverage than that again, and most people don't, but but if you do, then um, I sort of think it's getting more into the field of manipulation. Sure. Which is one of the things I want to put on the um, uh, on the costochondritisanswers.com page. Um, techniques for physiotherapists, in, including um, a range of manipulation techniques. Sure. Um, the, 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 I, I should mention with uh, costochondritis, um, unfortunately, one of the, the classic chiropractic technique um, is uh, a sort of a body slam manipulation. We use it ourselves, but um, the, uh, so you, you're putting your fist underneath the patient's back. Um, and then um, it's also known as the Valentino technique because you're sort of doing a... Um, uh, <laughs> <Yep. laughs> uh, it's got a number of names in New Zealand. Um, Interesting. Uh, anyway, the, the um, uh, it's also known as a dog technique over here because it was being demonstrated to a group of uh, doctors who were learning musculoskeletal medicine by a physiotherapist. And one of them stood up and said, I wouldn't use that technique on my dog and work. Oh, funny. <laughs> but, oh, but, hilarious. Um, anyway, this is the New Zealand dog technique, but it's a it's a standard <laughs> uh, thoracic manipulation where you you you're putting your chest on top of the patient's and, and pushing down hard uh, while your fist is underneath the patient's spine or ribs. And it, it's it's a perfectly useful technique um, uh, in a lot of ways. But with costochondritis, it's a dumb technique because um, to for it to work, you're squashing down on the front of the sternum. Sure. You've already got the really strained, um, like sprained ankles. There are um, sore there. Right. Um, little joints there. So it just, again and again, from all the um, feedback I've had over the years, um, that technique being used um, flares the, uh, you know, strains the already strained rib hinges on the front badly. So there are other ways of... Um, um, uh, other manipulation techniques as well, and um, uh, I want to put those up on this. Um, that would this be page perfect. Do it. So, um, um, but generally speaking, if you if you can get the the back pod working fully, um, and you can also talk someone into doing that massage because um, the muscles over the top of it will be tight as well. Generally, that'll do most things, in, including that twisting um exercise that i've i've mentioned just to to work the machinery and and the spin-off with that is that you can hit a golf ball further bob exactly which again, <laughs> that's been highly useful exactly um, I, you know um, i want to bring up um what's the difference between costochondritis and is it tsetse yes um uh tsetse syndrome um uh, comes from a 1921 um, letter by uh, Dr. Tietze in Berlin. And there's this whole um, Tietze's syndrome now. Now, I've gone back to that original letter and got it translated from the German by um, a couple of friends. Um, and in it, Dr. Tietze is saying, uh, look, I've come across these four patients and they've got this mysterious chest pain. Does anyone know what's going on? So the sure. letter is not defining a syndrome. It's just this guy saying, um, um, look, I don't know what's happening. Um, it's, it's, it's not inflammation. It's not this. It's not that. Um, anybody got any ideas? So from that, it's become Tietze syndrome. And um, there's, there's a... Um, a very tight definition, which says it's only the the, um, the the two ribs up the top, but that's not what Dr. Tietze said. When you go sure. back to the, it, it felt a bit like Alice in Wonderland when I was going oh, yeah. through the um, through the research because the actual research was just saying different things from what the generalized view of the research was. Um, sure. Anyway, but the thing well, was basically Tietze, it's the same thing. Is what exactly. you're saying. Um, it, it's the same as costochondritis, except it's bad enough 
that you're actually getting swelling showing where the rib joints are joining onto the breastbone. I see. And this, this is emphatically not an autoimmune swelling or a systemic swelling or any mysterious swelling. It's exactly the same thing you get if you sprain your ankle and the ankle swells up and after a while it'll it'll go hard after a week or so. Sure. Um, but the thing with so the thing with costochondritis is so to be clear, TC syndrome is only costochondritis with um, enough of a strain to actually be showing swelling. Gotcha. It's not a different entity in the slightest. Um, and the other thing with um, you know, I'm, I'm explaining it like a sprained ankle, which it is, but unlike a sprained ankle, you cannot rest it because every breath you take, those hinges are moving excessively. Sure. So it's like a, a sprained ankle that uh, you would never stop running on. Right. And um, that's why, uh, you know, the medications won't fix it. Um, it's like if, um, if the, the, it, you've got the seize machinery around the back, if it was the, a car with the handbrake jammed on, then putting additives in the petrol is not going to fix that problem. Right. What right. you've got to do is get to the mechanical basis of it. Exactly. So um, you, You've got great yeah. visualizations. I mean, great descriptions. Ah. So, um, um, it, it's, it's been such an interesting time. Um, and we do get, I, what keeps me going is I do get extraordinarily appreciative um, emails and letters. Oh, I'm and sure. Things. Um, and people generally want to help. And I say, look, you know, one, I mean, I got one yesterday morning. Um, you know, I've had costic arthritis for five years. This has fixed it. I hadn't had a problem for two years. Um, I said, great. Can you put that back onto um, YouTube or um, uh, an Amazon review or whatever? Because in a lot of ways, um, there's so much confusing stuff on the net that somebody coming through as a patient saying, look, I fixed it, has got more weight than me. Exactly. Saying, um, look, I've been doing this for 30 years. Um, you know, people trust other people. Right, and, exactly. Uh, yeah. Um, but... Uh, well, Steve, I'll, I'll tell you what, why don't we... Um, uh, unless you have any final comments, I, I mean, we're hoping to have you on the show again, and we're going to discuss some of the other things that the back pod is really good for um, at that time. But we wanted to kind of keep it confined to, oh, I wanted one more to topic, just real yeah. quick. How about COVID and Costo? Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, I'm swamped with inquiries about costochondritis left over after COVID-19. Um, uh, good point, Bob. Um, I, I meant to mention that as well. Um, so um, you can trigger uh, costochondritis, uh, the strain at the rib joints on the front, in various ways. And one of them is coughing. And ah. that's um, uh, from pneumonia, from the flu, or just a bad cold. I mean, it's a, it's a classic trigger of costochondritis. Now, I think this only happens if you're already tight on the rib joints around the back, but then so many people are these days as part of bending right. forward right. Um, right. with exactly. the other hunch. And so if you cough, um, coughing is a surprisingly strong um, percussive explosion inside your, your, your rib cage. And the rib joints around the front are, are fairly delicate anyway. So lots of coughing, um, if, the, if the back joints can't move, then what absorbs that shock has to be the, the front ones. And they're much more delicate anyway. So they start giving. And so you get this mysterious chest, you know, chest pain. Now, the doctors, um, unfortunately, are seeing it as a, as a leftover from COVID-19, and they're calling it long COVID, you know, COVID tail, what have you. Mm. Um, but it's really very clear um, the, um, the coughing and also the muscle spasm. You don't even necessarily need a whole lot of coughing, um, just the muscle spasm from, from having COVID-19 um, can be enough to, to trigger the strain of the, the rib joints on the front because the rib joints around the back are tight. And once that happens, it just keeps going because the, the tighter the ones around the back get, the more the ones at the front have to move excessively to... Um, 
to compensate. And of course they strain and you get, get pain. So definitely what, what you get, I'm getting so many questions from this, uh, from people who've had COVID-19 and they've come through and pretty much all the tests are fine. Thank heavens, the, the, you know, they're alive, they're good. Um, but they've got this mysterious costochondritis, which is not going away, which is not settling down um, uh, and which is not responding to any treatment for an inflammation or infection because it's not an inflammation or an right. infection. And the, the doctors, I mean, it's, it's not their fault, I mean, and, but really they don't, they don't get it. Their, their right. model of understanding it isn't correct. Um, and therefore the patients are just putting up with it. So what I've been getting um, is all this, all the queries about it. And apparently the back pod um, is now a great underground hit on a lot of the long COVID um, survivor oh, sites okay. from people who, who now fixed their costochondritis because they actually started working on the rib hinges. But it's, um, I mean, I, again, just to come back to where I, I started off, um, this is an extraordinary situation, Bob. The, yes. it, it, it's um, the, the answer and the understanding is there in um, physical therapy, physiotherapy. It's a, a physio problem. But the docs, because, largely because of the actual word that's used to describe the problem, right. uh, uh, are not um, um, seeing it correctly, and therefore they're, they're heading, not getting results. Yeah, they're and, heading down and, the wrong path. They're heading down the wrong path. It's yeah. it's just a red herring. We we actually tracked back through my um, uh, university medical school um, library to the um, the the initial. Um, use of this word costochondritis and it's the 1960s and um, it was called all sorts of things before that like chest wall pain and musculoskeletal chest pain and um, uh, sternocostal strain you know joint strain um, and then this word costochondritis started being used in the 1960s and um, and it took off and it became the default uh, term for the problem sure, so sure. people are using this and it contains this itis ending implying that the problem is an inflammation. And there is no uh, research or evidential basis for using that word for this problem because we went back and looked. It just came out of nowhere. And it's a catchy term, costochondritis. You know? Right, exactly. Um, and, but it's, it's a red herring. And as a consequence, you've got literally millions of people in the world in pain unnecessarily um, be, because of this problem. Um, yeah, well, so I, I, I'm trying hoping, to do something better. <laughs> yeah, as much as possible, I'm hoping we can help you get the word out because it, it's it really, you know, I've just seen it personally so much in family and friends, how just not yeah. for Costo, but for other problems that it's, it's been the answer. So really appreciate what all you've done. So, well, I'm, I'm, I'm so impressed with you and Brad spotting it and picking up on it and saying, yeah, this makes sense because it does make sense. Oh, that's the last bit I was going to say, by the way. The single best piece of research on costochondritis that exists in the world is a, a case series of eight by Zaruba and Wilson from, um, I'm pretty sure they're in Idaho, um, no, oh. Fargo. Anyway, university, is there a university in Fargo? Anyway, um, and they took, um, there are a couple of physiotherapists, physical therapists, and they took um, eight patients with chronic costochondritis. I mean, they'd had it for at least six months. I think some of them it was years. And they fixed them all by freeing up the, um, um, the rib hinges and the, the spinal hinges around the back. So completely fixed, which is what, you know, I'd expect to do with a right, costochondritis. Exactly. Patient. Um, now it's only a case series of eight, but um, nobody's done a randomized controlled trial to um, which has a bit more, you know, definitely has more validity. Right. We're doing one in New Zealand at the moment. Uh, we've got various doctors, um, including the prof of general practice and all um, locally here where I am. So we're shaping up for doing one, which will be the only randomized controlled trial anyone's ever done on any aspect of costochondritis. But that um, the case series of eight by Zaruba and Wilson is still um, a lovely piece of work. And although it's only eight, the, um, 
you can get away with shorter numbers if you've got a big change. And it was right. a big change. These people had chronic costochondritis. Now they don't have it. Um, so plus, what they plus did, it was eight for eight. Yeah, it was yeah. eight for eight. <laughs> yes. Um, and that's the best single piece of, um, of work done on how you fix costochondritis. And the whole thing comes through clearly. This is the way to look at it. This is the way to go. Um, and the, the, the in, inflammatory um, way um, just doesn't fit. That's it's a not fit. a good model. Right. Oh, and the last thing I was going to say about that was, um, and also there is a piece of work out there where they simply took um, um, a, a bunch of patients with costochondritis and a controlled bunch who didn't have costochondritis and looked at the inflammatory levels in their blood and there was no significant difference. Sure. So sure. It, it's, and I've also, when I've been lecturing, I've asked my um, you know, audience of experienced New Zealand doctors, um, how many, uh, you know, if you've done a, a, a blood test for costochondritis, have you ever had a positive? And out of about 600 experienced um, New Zealand docs, not one has ever oh my um, gosh. had raised inflammatory levels shown in a costochondritis patient. So it's really not a systemic inflammation. And treating it like that is going down the wrong alley. Right. Um, Absolutely. Well, I think that would be a good spot. I want to be respectful of your time. And I, again, hope to have you on in the future. Thanks again for joining us, Steve August. Bob, Thanks. thank you so much. I really appreciate the call. I'm, it's very early in the morning in New Zealand. I'm now going to get to coffee. Okay, sounds good. <laughs>